Hey guys, what's up? This is David Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos, and today I want to speak to you guys about prayer. And I'll, I'll be reading specifically from Evagrius Ponticus, or Evagrius of Pontus, and his writing called Admonition on Prayer. Now, why am I, wanting, why am I speaking to you guys about prayer? Well, prayer has been an, a particular important activity in my own antitheistic return to Christianity, but just in general, getting in touch to what I would consider the spiritual realm, uh, spiritual experiences, uh, God, the universe, the cosmos. And therefore, it, it, it set about you know six, seven months ago, choosing to do that, choosing to try to reach out to the creator of the universe, God, has set a cascading of events where Essentially, I found myself today, this is Sunday night, I'm going to be releasing this video tomorrow, Monday, but I found myself at St. John the Baptist Orthodox Church here in Berkeley, California. And this was from, you know, having, as you guys know, I read a lot about Eastern Orthodox, these mystics, these theologians, these ascetics. Last week, my video was on the wisdom of the desert, uh, Syriac church fathers, and today it will be as well. And I found myself in an Orthodox liturgical service, and it was absolutely beautiful. The ornateness, the intricacies, the his- historicity of the liturgy being so old. In fact, today was of Basil the Great, uh, wrote the liturgy that was performed. I, was just, I just found it really powerful, and I loved it. And that would have never happened if I didn't initially just try to pray and see what happened, and that kind of moved things within me. So therefore, today... I want to share some readings from Evagrius and this book right here called The Syriac Church Fathers on Prayer and the Spiritual Life. If you're interested in some of these desert ascetics, some of these desert uh, fathers, um, I highly recommend this book. It's really interesting. There's tons of different people inside of it. And I've been finding it very useful and interesting to read. So if that's something you're interested in or you like what you hear today, check it out. So, who is Evagrius before I dive into some of his uh, writings? Um, In the Greek, Evagrios Hopontikos, he uh, he lived from 345 to 399. He was a Christian theologian, a Christian monk, a Christian ascetic. He was arguably one of the most important figures in the 4th century. He was known as an incredible thinker, an incredible speaker, an incredible gifted writer, and what's really interesting for Evagrius is he is one of the few desert ascetics who was a highly trained and considered a scholastic individual. He wrote in Greek. In fact, he studied in Constantinople before he even found his way out into the desert. And he studied under incredible figures like Basil the Great, Gregory of Nazianzus, or Gregory the Theologian, and uh, Macarius of Egypt, who I talked about last week in the book, The Desert, uh, The Wisdom of the Desert, yes, by uh, Thomas Merton. So he studied under incredibly important people. Uh, Basil's arguably, you know, one of the biggest in Eastern Orthodox, but he also exert, exerted a tremendous influence upon other great figures like Maximus the Confessor and uh, Simeon the New Theologian, John of Damascus, Gregory Palamas, and Isaac of Nineveh, all of which I'll probably make a video on in the future, given their importance. And I'd love to talk about some of their ideas right now, but I want to stay focused on prayer um, in this video. And I want to try to make it as quick as possible and not make these really uh, long and potentially excessive videos. I don't know how you guys view them, but uh, I want to make it a little bit more concise today. So... What are some of the things that Evagrius was known for? Well, he was known for talking about emotions and tears and how that can open you up to God by first getting into a, an emotional place where you feel so thankful and you feel blessed and moved to the point of tears. In fact, he talked about weeping for days sometimes. And he also is important because he developed his logismoi, or the eight patterns of evil thought. And the eight patterns of evil thought are gluttony, lust, greed, sorrow slash despair, pride, 
wrath, vainglory, and sloth. Now, if those sound familiar, it's probably because you're familiar with the seven deadly sins, which in 590, Pope Gregory I will actually transfigure Evagrius's eight patterns of evil thought into the seven deadly sins. Now, he drops uh, sorrow and despair and vainglory and in turn adds envy. So, those are the seven deadly sins. And as I mentioned, Evagrius was a gifted um, speaker and writer, but he is known for being an effective communi- a communicator and spiritual educator to the point where he would not pontificate or use abstract language in which the laity or the average folk who he's speaking to would not understand. He was known to speak to people in a way in which they would understand what he's saying, therefore making it a lot more effective and powerful. So those are some of the things, a little background information about Evagrius. Now, what I want to do is read from this book on him talking about prayer. And, and what are some of the things that are going to come up that I found powerful and wanted to share with you guys? Well, one of them is to take baby steps. So what I'm first going to be talking about is how he says, essentially, you know, don't go from an average life to becoming a monk. That's not how it's going to work. You're going to burn out. You're going to lose desire. You're going to lose passion for it. Instead, have your life the way it is right now and make small degrees of movement, make small steps towards where you want to go. And by doing that, you're not going to get defeated but you're also going to build to a place and where, you know, eventually you're going to be in a much more righteous and holy place than you were before. So it's more about small steps and consistency than large steps and then eventually getting burnt out. Um, another thing he talks about is once you get to a place where you're doing that and you feel purified, God will be able to inhabit your body and work through you. And, You'll be able to see things and experience things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to. And he also talks about the necessity to pay attention, to stay focused, to stay on topic, to uh, be conscientious and conscious when you're praying, when you're talking to the creator of the universe. Um, And this is something that I'm a bit shameful of. As you guys know, I ramble sometimes, but... Even when I pray, particularly when I pray silently, my mind will wonder, and all of a sudden I'm thinking about something that has nothing to do with my prayer, and it's a bit embarrassing. It's shameful, and that's why part of what I'm going to read today spoke to me really powerfully because um, thoughts, material thoughts, thoughts about the world, potentially sinful thoughts will arise in my mind while I'm trying to pray, and you have to be stronger, you have to do better, you have to fight against those things is what he's going to talk about, although not in a way in which it demeans you in any way, but it's something that I noticed about myself and, and essentially find shameful. So those are just a few of the things that I'm going to read about and share with you guys, so I hope you find it as powerful as I did. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> You know very well, my brother, that someone who wants to set out on a long journey will first of all examine himself, and then he will attach himself to other travelers with whom he is able and willing to keep up. Otherwise, he may get left behind by his companions on the journey and come to harm. It is exactly the same with a person who wants to travel on the road to righteousness. First of all, let him look into himself and see how strong he is. Then let him choose a way of life that is appropriate to himself. It is better to be is better to begin one's feeble state and end up strong to progress from small things to big than to set your heart from the very first on the perfect way of life only to have to abandon it later or keep to it solely out of habit because of what others will think in which case this labor will be in vain it is the same with people who travel if they are ty- if If they tire themselves out on the very first day by rushing along, they will end up wasting many days as a result of sickness. But 
if they start out walking at a gentle pace until they have got accustomed to walking, in the end they will not get tired, even though they have walked great distances. Likewise, anyone who wishes to embark on the labors of the virtuous life should train himself gently until he finally reaches the perfect state. Do not be perplexed by many paths trodden by our fathers of old, each different from the other. Do not zealously try to imitate them all. This would only upset your way of life. Rather, choose a way of life that suits your feeble state. Travel on that, and you will live. For your Lord is merciful, and He will receive you, not because of your achievements, but because of your intention, because as He received the destitute woman's gift. And that's a reference to Mark twelve forty three. if you guys want to look that up, in regards to a, um, a poor woman who essentially gives little bit of money, but because she's so poor, it's, it's all she has, as opposed to the rich people who give more money, but in comparison to what they have, it's not that much. And Jesus says, you know, blessed is to her. So that's a reference to the poor woman who gives a little bit, but it's all she has. And that's kind of what he's saying is it just to, you know, make little steps, but also be all in and, and make it a serious intention. So that's Mark twelve forty three. If you are thinking of adding to your labors, do not be in a hurry. Be patient. Then, in the, if the idea remains with you, urging you on to yearn for something more ambitious, you may know that it is, it is to your advantage, and you carry out in your intention with confidence, for it is of God. But if the idea should come to you only once or twice and not again, then you should consider it to be of Satan who cunningly wants to hold you back. It is the same for all one's thoughts. As the fathers have said, do we not discern between them? So that first section is about, you know, slowly making your uh, progress by incremental steps. And I'm going to fast forward to another section. And here we go. <clears throat> Above everything else, choose, your, choose for yourself humility. Set an example and foundation by means of your good words. Bend down when you worship. Let your speech be lowly, so that you may be loved by both God and other men and women. Allow the Spirit of God to dwell within you. Then His love, then in His love, He will make He will come and make a hab- habitation with you. Sorry about that. He will reside in you and live in you. If your heart is pure, you will see him, and he will sow in you the good seed of reflection upon his actions and wonder at his majesty. This will happen if you take the trouble to weed out from your soul the undergrowth of desires, along with the thorns and tares of bad habits. A sinner who begins to show concern over his soul and who becomes penitent is like a kitchen utensil which is full of filth and blackened, yet once washed and scrubbed, it glistens. Again, he resembles a piece of charcoal that was dark colored and cold, but when it is put in the fire, it becomes hot and glows. Or he is like gold and silver vessels which are badly discolored, but when polished up, You could also compare him to a corpse into which the soul is breathed, and that is a symbolic representation of the Holy Spirit because God's breath, wind, that is the Holy Spirit. That's how he animates Adam, right? Or you could also compare him to a corpse into which the soul is breathed, to a dead person who has come to life to someone lost who has been found, to a stray lamb that has returned, to a sick person who has recovered, to someone poverty-stricken who has become rich, to a person mourning who now rejoices, to someone starving who has got enough to eat, to a royal portrait that has been renovated, to a ruined house into which a king has entered and taken up residence after having restored it. So, the reason I highlighted that section is I thought it was powerful to, once you start making these slow degrees, these slow steps towards working on yourself and perfecting yourself, that then God will reimburse you by coming into your life, coming into your body and animating you and uh, your intentions, your movements and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Okay, so now I'm skipping to my last section, which is a little long. It's about four pages, so bear with me here. 
And when you want to get up to pray during the night and your body is feeling sluggish, ponder all these things and recall to your mind how many others are standing in prayer on their feet or are bowed or kneeling. How many are weeping and gasping amid groans? How many are lamenting at the body's sluggishness? How many are drunk with love and have forgotten their own natures? How many are singing in their hearts to the Lord? If you think about all this, then you'll find relief from your own sluggishness and your weariness, and you will offer up your prayer eagerly and with many tears. Then recollect how many are awake, or recollect how many are awake and at their, own, and at their work, how many are traveling on journeys or are plowing or carrying out various crafts. Remember the shepherds, the night watchmen, those guarding their treasures. If all these take such trouble over things that are transient, how much more should I take trouble over my Lord? When you stand up for prayer, do not begin in a slovenly way, lest you, lest you perform all your prayer in a slack or slovenly and wearied way. Rather, when you stand up, sign yourself with the sign of the cross. So in Eastern Orthodox, that's up, down, right to left, as opposed to Catholicism, which is up, down, left to right. So just FYI there. <clears throat> Rather, when you stand up, sign yourself with the sign of the cross. Gather together your thoughts. Be in a state of recollection and readiness. Gaze upon him to whom you are praying, and then commence. Force yourself so that right at the beginning of your prayer, tears may flow and you feel suffering in yourself so that your whole prayer may prove beneficial. When you do not have thoughts which hinder you, it is not necessary to make space between one group of psalms and the next. But if your thoughts are in turmoil, and you should spend more time in prayers and tears, but if your thoughts are in turmoil, you should spend more time in prayers and tears than in the recitation of the psalms. Drive your thoughts away by whatever means you have tested out, whether by varying the words or by some other means. Take in what I am telling you. If you should, then you have beneficial thought. Let it take place in the Psalms for you. Okay, I just... If, if you should then have some beneficial thought, let it take place in the Psalms for you. Do not push away from yourself what is the gift of God just in order to fulfill your prescribed portion of Psalms. Prayer that does not have... Prayer that does not have mingled into it the thought of God and interior vision is a weariness of the flesh. Now, I liked that line. Thought of God and interior vision. So, he's talking about, you know, using your imagination during prayer and your communication with God, which kind of connects to, you know, much more recent stuff, like in my earlier video on the six uh, characteristics of esoteric spirituality and how the imagination is like this mediator between you and the divine. Well, he's saying this right here in the fourth century. So I find that really interesting and something that a lot of these desert ascetics were already kind of on to. <clears throat> Do not rejoice over saying a great quantity of psalms when a veil is thrown over your heart. A single word said with an attentive mind is better than a thousand with the mind far away. At the time of prayer, be straightforward and simple and astute, child, and the and then you will, hold, you will behold the glory of God. Remove from yourself all crooked and evil thoughts. Make yourself like a weaned child with its mother. Blessed are you if you have to struggle hard in prayer. Say your words. Offer up your complaint. Seek out your judge. Reply to your adversary Satan with anger until he is defeated. Then your Lord will see your vigilance and will adjudicate your case with righteousness, condemning your enemy so that he will no longer be found, while at the same time giving support to your weakness. If the pleasurable passion should fight against you, seek escape from them from your Lord. And if unclean thoughts should enter your mind, do not be upset. Just refuse to consent to them. Do not accept them or allow them any place in your mind, and then they will leave all of a sudden and run off like a traveler who turns aside for the night, but then moves off early. Be careful lest your mind wander during your time of prayer, thinking about empty things. In that case, you will stir the judge to anger rather than to goodwill, seeing that he has been insulted by you. 
Should you be afraid in the presence of ordinary judges, but show contempt in the presence of God? How can a person who is not aware of where he is standing and what he is saying imagine of himself that he is offering up prayer? His mind is blinded by passions. He stands on his feet. He is without sleep. He remains from worldly activities. He is thought by many to be dead to the world and forgetful of such things. Yet he is enticed by the thought of matters far, far away from him. And so none of these other things are of any benefit to him, just as dreams do not bring any advantage to those who see them. Espouse, arouse yourself, wretch. Your Lord is speaking to with you. <laughs> Sorry. Arouse yourself, wretch. Your Lord is speaking with you. Do not wander off. His elect angels surround you. Do not be dismayed. The ranks of the demons stand facing you, so do not grow lax. Your bro- my brother, realize that just as the angels rejoice when, you, when we praise God, following their example, so too the demons are aggrieved when they see us paying attention in prayer. Because they themselves have refused to give praise, they devise ways of preventing us from praising God, seeing that their machinations are foiled by praise, it being a shield and armor against them. According to the, accordingly, they are eager to hold us back from our service, and when they see that we are not listening to them, but are always constant in our converse with God, then they act cunningly in order to do harm by means of thoughts and worries about particular persons, imagining conversations with them, sometimes with friends, sometimes with enemies, in order to exchange our love, our love of God for love of men. The result is that... Instead of praying for our enemies as we are bidden, we acquire hatred for those who have grieved us, and so our prayer becomes the cause of anger. Beware, then, the ambushes of the adversaries. Guard yourself against those who are intent on adding to their weakness, (laughs) are intent on adding to their wickedness, erring themselves, and causing others to err, to err. Set off on the path of prayer with confidence, then swiftly and speedily will you reach the place of peace, which is your stronghold against the place of fear. Thus, while your mind is wide awake and attentive, the offering of your prayer will be accepted, as was Abel's offering, Cain and Abel, whereas your adversary will be put to shame, and your and you yourself will prove an object of fear to the demons at your time of prayer, and the words of your mouth will be in accord with the will of God. So that's just what I wanted to read with you guys today. Um, I hope you like that. It was powerful for me, especially the part where they're talking about, um, you know, staying focused and, and not getting off topic. Uh, and, and when you're talking about prayer, not letting evil or worldly thoughts get into your mind. That's something that I've had a problem with personally. So anyways, I just wanted to share that because I found it powerful for myself. Um, Hopefully you guys like it. I got a handful of stuff that I want to make. I've just been swamped with school last week, so I was only able to make one video. I'm hoping that I'll be able to make a couple more videos this week. Um, I'm working through a couple new books. Uh, One of them that I just got, um, what is today, Sunday? Saturday. I actually just got this yesterday. This is Alchemically Stoned, and this is by P.D. Newman. He is a 32nd degree Freemason, and he has this uh, book. This is printed uh, late 2017, so it's been over a year and a half, almost two years. Um, And he's talking about DMT, the Acacia Bush, Fly Agaric, Ergot, uh, morning glory seeds and how they were used in various Masonic rituals from Russia to the Middle East, from Sufic traditions and all this stuff. Really interesting. Again, I haven't read very much as you can see, but it's not that big of a book. Um, another one that I'm slowly working through that I've been finding very interesting is The Devil's Pulpit by um, Reverend Robert Taylor. And this book put this man in jail, Robert Reverend Taylor. It's basically about astrotheology and how Christianity uh, is an ast- astrological religion or has an astrological basis in it. Um, of course, he was 
put in jail and he was, uh, they burnt his manuscripts. Luckily, some of his, this is all sermons. <clears throat> Luckily, he had other copies that survived and was able to put into a book. But as you guys know, you know, the Jesus, the sun, solar tradition, Sunday, Christmas, Easter, all this stuff. Well, he goes into it a little bit deeper and he really focuses on the Zodiac. He focuses on the Greek and the Latin. He has this theory that I have never heard ever which I don't know how true it is, but the idea that the New Testament was actually written in Greek, and then it was uh, translated into, or <laughs> sorry, it was originally written in Latin, then it was translated into the Greek, and, and made everybody think that it was originally written in Greek, and then from the Greek translated back into the Latin to confuse people from a lot of the semantic and etymological roots, um, the philological connections to... I guess, Roman astrology and stuff like that. So it's pretty interesting. And uh, there is some stuff that I've never heard before that does make sense. There's some stuff that I've never heard before that I question that I'm going to have to bring up to some actual biblical Old and New Testament scholars to see what they think. But I also got uh, a new book that just came in on Simeon, the New Theologian. It's on the Discourse. I mean, it's called The Discourses. It's not his mystical stuff. Um, he's known, Simeon the New Theologian is known for his mysticism where, uh, and hesychasm where he has these mystical unions with God in regards to visionary experiences of light. I thought that was very psychedelic in nature. That's why I was so fascinated by him. And plus, I had never heard of Simeon the New Theologian when I discovered him. I also plan on making a video on Maximus the Confessor. Uh, he has this wonderful idea that I want to go into a little bit deeper and read to you guys about every individual being a cosmos, and therefore speaking truth, you can orient your own cosmos. Again, Jesus' reason, logic, language, he's the Logos. And through the Logos, you can organize your cosmos, and then you can speak truth and organize other people who are a cosmos, organize them as a cosmos. But by doing that, you're also organizing the actual cosmos. So it's kind of like this micro, micro, macro perspective that you see in Hermeticism and is later revived in Ficino and Pico, as I brought up in their video, in later Hermetic and uh, uh, Western esoteric traditions, right? That the micro, macro, and then the human being being a, being a microcosm. Well, we have it right there in the sixth century with Maximus the Confessor, which I think is really interesting. So Hopefully you like the video. Those are some things that I plan on putting out in the future. I also have, like, I read through the Gospel of Philip. I was going to do a video on that. I just got so busy last week that I I, uh, I just hadn't had time to do anything. I haven't even made a video for my other YouTube channel. So anyways, guys, uh, hope you liked it. Let me know kind of what you guys are thinking do you pray? Is prayer a practice that you use, whether you're Muslim, Christian, Gnostic? I know some of the guys here are Gnostic, which is interesting and pretty cool. Um, I'd love to know what type of rituals you guys do, but maybe that's another video as we'll just focus on rituals and maybe you guys can share what, what rituals you guys do. I don't know. Anyways, Thanks for all the love. Please like, share, and subscribe to this video. If you know anybody who's interested in this kind of content, please send them to this channel. It's a new channel. It's a young channel. And uh, I'm always looking to grow the, the conversation and add new perspectives. So thanks again for all the love and support. Love you guys. And God bless.